What a beautiful day today. Got my windows open. Weather's getting nicer. Sun is out. Just came back from, from a walk. And here we are. Just going to record another uh, sketchbook dive. Where I dive into a little sketchbook session. Uh, let's see what I got here. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking the... Uh, the purpose of this is to have fun for myself, but also for you as the viewer, fellow artist, to kind of get some art going for yourself or just to kind of watch. Uh, or it doesn't even matter what I'm drawing. If you just want to feel like you have somebody you're drawing with, that's cool too. Um, I don't know what to draw, so I'm just going to just dive right in. Ah, so I do hope everything is great for you. Life for me seems to be going pretty well. Uh, despite all the difficulties. You know, I saw a funny clip from Dr. K's stream. And if you don't know who Dr. K is, he's a... Uh, professional mental health psychologist, doctor, fellow person. Um, and in the clip, it was like, uh, are we a cult? Because, you know, he runs this whole, like, healthy gamer uh, Twitch stream where they kind of have uh, coaches and that kind of way of running things. And, you know, they kind of joke around about it being a cult. And obviously, it was just kind of a joke. Uh, but in the comments, someone said, it's definitely not a cult, but it is a huge, massive parasocial relationship. And uh, kind of got me thinking. If you don't know what parasocial is, I don't know if I have the, the best definition of it. Um, but I have a slight idea. It's this kind of idea where there's obviously many social media people out there in the world and many of them have audiences and followers as the follower or the viewer or being a member of the audience you almost feel like you have a direct connection with that streamer or social media person almost like you know so much about them and it's almost like you're on a personal level with that person, especially if you watch them for hours upon hours during the day, whether they're playing games or just chatting, whatever, or just YouTube videos like mine, where it's just me kind of doing my thing anyway. Uh, but there's, there's this kind of weird connection there and they're calling it a parasocial connection where, you know, um, you know me, but I don't know you. And you might even think you know me or you know the streamer or you feel like they're kind of like a, a personal connection. And in your mind, you might build up this kind of mental model of who you feel and think that person is. And so for me... That, you know, that could be good or bad, but I think it, it might lead to, I guess, confusion, wishful thinking, delusion, all that stuff. I, I guess the reason I, I was thinking about that and the reason I'm bringing it up is that I have, you know, a lot of content on here. I am pretty open about a lot of things, but... um you know, and to the point where a lot of people, even at Lightbox in person, come up to me as if they kind of already know me because they do or they know a big part of me. And, uh, <laughs> and it's just like they talk to me as if we've known each other for so long, which is great. That's fine. Um, and I'm not really complaining. It's just interesting that from my perspective, like 
I don't know who you are and uh in in such a way that like it it's a it's a beautiful thing but it's also like a one-way street situation where when it comes to personal connection at least and I know most people or a lot of people do understand that it is just all online and you know the person you think you know um is just another person and so uh i guess 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 i just want to clear some things up um i'm certainly without a doubt not a perfect person i mean i literally have videos titled i am a flawed person um and so if you do have an idea of me just keep in mind not just me, but with all social media people or all personalities that you kind of come across online, that they're also just people. And you don't, I don't think it's a good idea to idealize an image of someone in your mind. It might help to kind of have that kind of image to build up a sort of goal to have, which is fine. But I don't know. What I'm trying to say is I'm just a person. A person sketching and trying to talk at the same time. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty big important thing. That And it's such a new thing too. I guess back in the day, sure, there were media personalities and uh, pundits and news anchors and all that and even celebrities and stars and, uh, and whatnot. But now with the internet, there's this kind of like direct connection and it's a bridge from them to you where you can now interact with those people, whether it's through chat, comments, likes, dislikes, um, whatever, it, it is a new interaction that humans have now as a civilization where we can almost feel like we're, we're everyone is part of the conversation. And in a way, that is the case. But I think it may lead to delusional assumptions and and like i said kind of like a wishful thinking kind of thing where your heroes are these perfect beings and you know if they don't live up to what you wanted them to be suddenly your your world is shattered so i don't know uh, you know, it's especially if I was uh, really young and looking for a kind of connection with, with people and if I already had a hard time at school with making connections, which I did, I could totally see myself getting caught up in that and feeling like, hey, this is my my way of finally connecting with, with the world and and isn't it so great that the person I am connecting with also plays the same games or has the same interest in art and stuff? Almost as though that person is fulfilling the unmet needs that I would have had. And there's a sort of dependency I would see emerging from that, like this... This person online is now, in my mind, going to have the responsibility of living up to accommodating those unmet needs. And therefore, when they don't do that, things get very messy. So yeah, I don't know. 
for wh- whatever position you are, are you are in, either the parasocial position or in a place of understanding and realizing this is, I don't know you and, I mean, I know some of you, obviously, but um, the goal in my mind for all of this is that we find a way to humanize the other person. Because, you know, dehumanizing people might seem like it's, oh, it's just when you kind of belittle them and see them as insignificant and not worth your time and uh, unworthy of, of human rights, that kind of thing. And that's a bad thing. But another way people are dehumanized is when we idolize them as literal statues and idols of perfection. That is another form of dehumanization. And if you can find a way to, I guess, undo that, if you if you find yourself stuck in that um, mindset or mind frame, it would be ideal. Because I don't I don't think anyone wants to be seen. Well, I'm sure there are a lot of people who want to be seen as these special godly beings who are so above everybody. I mean, I've certainly had moments like that where I, where my ego was just like wanting me to be seen as that, but that's just a compensation for insecurities and, and my own unmet childhood needs kind of thing. But I think self-awareness is key. Taking a step back, seeing where you are and moving forward. Uh, anyway, that was just right at the tip of my mind. So I decided to talk about that, but let's move on to another thought. Uh, I had a friend here who was, um, struggling to find purpose. Well, not purpose, but a willingness and motivation to post online or, or create artwork and it kind of boiled down to uh, perfectionism. And I think I'll, I'm going to probably do a separate video on this, kind of diving into this a little bit more in depth with charts and, <laughs> you know, studies and stuff. But because um, from his point of view, what it felt like, and I was definitely going through the same thing, what it felt like was in order to share something with the world or make a piece of art, it's as though you're kind of backstage at some kind of presentation thing. Imagine like America's Got Talent or or American Idol or whatever, Sweden Idol, whatever. Basically, there are judges out there or friends or whatever, but you're, you're going to go up on stage and you're going to present this thing to the world. And just by thinking that, you know, of course we want to make something cool, something good, naturally. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Because you don't want to let people down or, or you want to show your best version of yourself and you want to put it, your all in there. And so that could be good but it could also be bad because if you're backstage and and a thing you're you're about to present or that you want to present is is in your hands it's in front of you you're working on it you're trying to make it perfect you're trying to make it beautiful you're trying to whatever it's as though you're trying to polish this golden egg and make it perfect and this is an analogy and, and metaphor for anything. It could be before you post on Instagram, before you send your portfolio to a studio, before blah, 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 anything. And so if you're a perfectionist like myself and like my friend, you end up putting extremely high standards and a high bar on the thing you do, which is fine from a production design standpoint. But the problem with that is you have this one one egg, this one shiny golden egg that you're sitting there polishing and polishing, and then you're 
frantically noticing mistakes and like, oh, this is a flaw. Oh, oh this is really bad. I didn't, I didn't learn perspective yet. I, I should have, I should have used this program. I, I, oh, oh, I should have used that reference. Oh, look at that artwork over there. That's so good. It's so much better than mine. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna actually like not go up on stage. I'm gonna stay behind here. I'm gonna start over, and, and I'm gonna try it again, uh, and make it better. And then you try again on this new golden egg and like, okay, it's a, it's, it's a little better. Oh my God. No, wait, 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 wait. It's still not as good as I want it to be. Screw this. I'm going to keep polishing this egg. I'm going to keep focusing on it. It's got to be perfect. It's got to be perfect. It's got to be perfect. And, uh, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about if you're a perfectionist, but the problem with that is that prevents you from actually making your best work. And here's why. Uh, I believe in the book, Art of Fear, uh, Art and Fear. Let me just grab it. Uh, this book, Art and Fear, Observations on the Perils and Rewards of Art Making by David Bales and Ted Orland. Uh, I, I just recently tried to start it again because every time I start reading it, I like find something that's like, oh my God, I need to sit and think about that and I'll write about it. And that's as far as I got. And I've had this book for years. Um, so there's a lot of golden nuggets, but there's a, my, my friend Theo who recommended this, um, told me about this, this idea, this chapter in there. It could be a different book, but I'm pretty sure it's this one where this teacher at an art school was teaching a ceramics class, I believe. And he told two different groups of students to, to, to do to two different things. So group A was told their grade for their uh, class that they get will be based on the amount of uh, ceramic pots or clay pots that they make. So the more you make, the better your grade is. Doesn't matter how good, doesn't matter how bad, as long as you make as many as you can. Group B was told your grade will depend on one pot or one ceramic clay thing that you submit. And it has to be your, your best, most carefully designed and, and perfected design uh, at the end of the semester and you'll submit it. And so my assumption was that group B, the students who had to perfect it and just submit one would have a better result. But what ended up happening is in the first group where all they had to do is just keep making a whole bunch, they weren't really concerned with trying to perfect things. And the first batch that they did, of course, was not very good. But towards the end, after making so many, the ones towards the end were actually better than the group B assignment where they had to make their best one. So what that tells us is the thing you're looking for will be a result of action over time by repetition, by exploration, and not putting that pressure on yourself to make it perfect. It's kind of like, um, let me just uh, do it like this. So if you're, if you're watching the screen, let's say this is your timeline of, you know, wanting to make a perfect thing. Like we all have ideals. We all know what looks good to us when we see beautiful artwork or stories that we love. And because that ideal is floating there, if you're a perfectionist, it's a very heavy ideal. It's weighing down on what it is that you want to make, right? And so here in this timeline, this progress bar, each block represents a new thing that you do. And so when you introduce the first thing that you do, like, okay, I'm going to make this perfect thing. Let's say that's a little golden egg. And as you're doing it, you keep measuring it against this thing, this ideal, this perfect ideal. And because of that, and because you know what looks good and you know what looks bad, 
you, you take your thing and you compare it next to that and like, oh my God, this is horrible. This is bad. This is bad. And then you just end up giving up. It's demoralizing. And then you're still stuck here. Right? And then you try to look at it again and make it perfect, 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 perfect. Trying to get this result and it just feels rigid, stiff, boring, forced. You hate it. You hate every second of making it. And the result is just pure suffering, <laughs> at least for me. That's that's group B. Um, whereas, let's look at it in a different light. If, sure, you have the ideal, and it might be multiple ideals, like different styles, different stories, different feelings, color palettes, um, different tools, whatever. You might have those ideals floating up there. But if that's not your intent, and your intent is instead to just create over time by doing this, doing that, doing this, and then you know some of the pieces that you do start to kind of peek up above that threshold and say, oh, it's oh that one was really good. Oh, ah, but then I got bad again. Oh, this one was really good too. And what ends up happening is over time, you'll have these peaks of glimpses into things looking really good. And you won't even realize it happened. But the key here is the willingness to do bad, bad. It's okay. This is bad. It's okay. It's like getting better. Oh, that one's really good. Oh, it's bad again. But by not focusing on always trying to make that first piece or the first few pieces perfect and ideal before you put it out there, um, you give yourself room to do the necessary bad ones so that overall, on the graph, there's an upward trajectory towards, quote unquote, the ideal. So, um, you know, f for example, like this, this drawing, I guess a couple weeks ago, if I was trying to pick something to draw for the, for the YouTube video or, or sketchbook, whatever, um, I would have been in this mindset. I got to find the right reference. I want to find something cool. I want to, you know, make sure everybody's happy with what they're seeing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I want to use the right, I guess, uh, lighting <clears throat> and perspective or whatever. And then I would have over analyzed and overthought all the aspects of it, causing this creation to be frustrating. But now in this mindset, I'll just be like, whatever it is, it is what it is. And I could do a thousand of them. And being okay with, you know, you know that's a pretty decent drawing but if it was bad to be okay with it is the goal as opposed to looking at this and saying well i didn't sit there and get reference for the clothing and trying to design it perfectly uh it's not good enough erase it all and start over that would be this mindset and so um you know try not to focus too much on making your first batch or actually any of them, try not to make them measured against the ideal. That's not to say, you know, you shouldn't try really hard and study the ideal artworks that you love because um, that's very necessary to look at those works and try to learn from them. But the unnecessary part is, you know, the process of hating yourself and and just being miserable because your work doesn't align with that ideal. So in a way, give yourself permission to do this in the face of the demand to do, to do that. Because it certainly helped me. And I've felt this a lot recently with the, the videos on, on Wednesdays where I'm doing the reference Wednesdays because I don't really have a choice in terms of what image is going to be uh, randomized in that program that I'm using called gesture drawing, all I do is select the folder and it's almost like trusting the RNG or the universe to just present something and me as an artist, I'm like a funnel. So here's a funnel and the universe, let's just draw a little star, a little sun, some nebulae, here's a black hole, here's stardust here's um 
gravity doing its weird thing. Whatever. The universe, those are stars far away, um, informs my experience as a human. And whatever that stuff is, if I try to force it to be something specific, that's one thing. If I let it be whatever it will be, that's another. This is me. This is you. This is you as an artist. Whatever that whatever goes in, you can interpret, and that is your art. Now, you might say, "Well, I don't want to draw what's in front of me. I don't want to, uh, you know, let the universe define what I do." So that's also another way to think about it. Let's say the universe gives you this. You as an artist say, "I don't want, you know, X," and so you want to do B right? Even that is an interpretation of what the universe is showing you. Your rejection of whatever it's kind of putting in front of you, whether it's uh, music, you know, people fighting or uh, witnessing some insects, you know, outside or something. Uh, it's just a starting point. But trusting that you don't have to be in control of abs absolutely everything just to match an ideal and trusting the universe to give you uh, stimulation or stim not stimuli, stimuli for you to create things is kind of like a relief. It's, it's putting all the weight onto that as opposed to trying to polish that golden egg. And, you know, you don't have to be all cosmic and spiritual about anything it's just you as a person uh you don't have to be so hard on yourself because i've been there we've all been there So I was recording content for my uh, digital painting course for painting heads and faces and concept art for that stuff. And I thought it would just be, yeah, I know the stuff. I'll just record it easy. No problem. But as I'm doing it, um, I've been talking about it for so long. I discover that I don't know as much as I thought I did. Because in my head, I'm like, yeah, I, I know the concepts of a skull. And then when I go to actually explain it, I'm like, hold up. There are so many details that I completely overlooked before. And so it's been a really nice kind of invigorating new learning experience. Like, did you know that this little thing is on the back of the skull? <laughs> like, what is that? I've always ignored it. This is the Proko skull, by the way. And, and this is like a, an egg shape. We know that. Um, but the egg shape in the cranium kind of intersects the mandible here about halfway, you know, kind of like where the teeth are. So if you drew, God, it's just completely random. Uh, if you have the egg shape and you want to know where the jaw is, well, at the very least, if you have this intersecting something halfway, you know, here's the halfway point that can kind of give you where the jaw is, right? Crazy. And you got the uh, cheekbone. So the cheekbones, because I'm doing a, a lesson where it's simplifying all the shapes of the skull so that it's easy to remember and um, makes everything else easier for painting lighting and, and, understanding where the shadows fall and stuff. The cheekbone is probably the hardest thing to simplify as basic shapes. Cause it, I could say it's just a, like a box, you know, like a, a rectangle that goes through, but there's this curvature here that makes it so confusing. And it's also an angled curvature from this angle. And then, um, 
I don't, I don't get into the complexities of, of this stuff, which you could, but um, yeah. Anyway, anyway, back to drawing. I don't know if you can hear the birds outside. It's kind of nice. All right, cool. Anyway. <sighs> yeah. Don't polish the golden egg. Yeah, I recently had a talk with my good buddy Steven Zapata. And uh, his content, by the way, is getting really nice. I mean, it already was, but um, I think he, he just recently passed over 30,000 followers. He's growing fast. But um, he posted a video a couple weeks ago, and it sort of reminded me of what you can do as a orator or narrator or youtuber whatever um so i, I was like huh he's stepping up the game i gotta i gotta get on that so i, I remember for my next video the medcast the recent one i wrote out a script and kind of put my thoughts on there and uh it was good i had a good time and people really resonated with it. But there was this one comment <laughs> that was like, huh, wonder why you're trying to copy Steven Zapata. And I think my way of speaking and cadence is, is very similar to his. And there's a reason for that. Um, back at Art Center, I could not speak or give a presentation at all. It was just bad. And he went up to do his presentations and just killed it it was entertaining very smart eloquent he could weave beautiful narratives out of thin air and i'm like dude teach me and so we traded i you know i showed him a couple tricks here and there for painting and he uh taught me what he knew from the theater experience uh, being in theater in high school and as well as just his ability to construct narratives and, and he reads a lot so yeah it, it makes sense that um the way I, I speak and the way i wrote that was very similar to his i felt guilty at first I'm like, oh man crap i'm just copying him then i talked to him and we talked about that and he's like no 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 no, no. it's not valid not a valid criticism because we had that trade back in the day and i'm like oh yeah He's very good at talking. <laughs> He's probably one of the best in the world, man. You know, I coming up with a uh, an arrangement of words that can kind of paint an image in your mind and make you feel things. It's a very powerful tool. And there was this other comment. It was mostly good comments um, of someone saying that it was BS, all this flowery, poetic, haiku, whatever bs i'm like about the uh the social media metaphor i was talking about where i described social media as this swirling dome of madness that you want to escape and i'm thinking like yo first of all chill it's just a metaphor um kind of feel bad for that kind of outlook You know, because it's obviously very helpful for people as well as myself to kind of look at things like that and take a breather and walk away from social media from time to time. But it doesn't bother me. I just laughed. I laugh. It would have bothered me way more in the past when I was far more insecure about my position in the world. But we all good now.
God, what is she doing? <laughs> it's like she's about to lay an egg. We're going to just change that. She could also be like a uh, riding on a broomstick. Like a witch. I really like the flow of the hair where it's kind of orienting on the surfaces of these shapes. Oh yeah, <laughs> watching um Ergo Josh video about uh the three letter words that I probably won't talk about just yet because I sort of observing right now, but, uh, I commented like, Hey, we got to have a calm voice battle where, um, like a voice off challenge. He has a very calming voice. But I challenge him to a duel. Bring forth your calmest voice, yes. I don't understand what's going on fully with that whole situation, by the way. Looks like a weird war that came out of nowhere. Pick a side, pick a side. It's like, mm. If you're not with us, you're against us. All right, dude. Let's calm down. I think that's another moment or another subject regarding the, I'll just say it, the, the NFTs. Uh, like, in a way, we seem to be dehumanizing each other, depending on your stance on it. And um, I would love, ideally, obviously, I know it's not really a realistic thing to have, but if we can just take a step back whatever your stance is, whatever your justifications are, but just remember that the person you're screaming at or disagreeing with or whatever, it, they are people too. And it seems like it's one of those things where, sure, there's surface reasons for your justifications or resentment or whatever, but a lot of us just have deep-seated problems that surface and then use the guise of, you know, morality and whatever to push people down and blame them for our own problems. Such is human nature. Such is the nature of most living things, crabs in a bucket, etc. But again, I'm not declaring one side is right and wrong, whatever. Just making an observation on the lack of humanity that happens in these situations. And I'm not trying to claim I have some kind of moral high ground or that I'm better, or that other people are better, or you're lesser if you believe this or that. At the end of the day, we're just artists. Certainly do take care to try to leave a positive thing in the world and not destroy it. But that's not just with 
I guess, um, the ecological standpoint, but also not burning bridges because you're caught up in a moment, you know? But I do have faith. I'm pretty optimistic that there are sensible people left in the world who are not enraged over things to the point where they want to burn people at the stake. <sighs> quick tip for shading stuff. So right here I have this strand of hair and I want that kind of effect where it's kind of shiny. Um, but the question is, where do I put that highlight? Because I could put it in the middle or on the third or something, but what I'm going to allow to dictate that location is what what's going on behind it. So in this sphere where this bottom half is darker, it's a great opportunity to use that highlight to contrast against that darkness and vice versa. Where it's brighter in the background, on the hair, I'm going to make it darker. And so, because if I shaded it as being dark here, it'll blend in with that part of the background. I don't want that. So, I'm going to go along and look for another opportunity to make it dark against a white background right there. And now suddenly it always stands out as opposed to kind of merging. You don't always want to do that and make everything stand out at all times in every spot, but you can be strategic as to where those focal points are. I don't know if you can hear that helicopter, but it's kind of nice to get that sense of spring. <laughs> yeah, helicopters represent spring. Spring. No, that's not what I mean. Um, having the windows open. The, the unfortunate thing about being in the Midwest here in Ohio, especially after living in California and coming back here, is that the weather is so weird. It's never, it won't commit. It has commitment issues. Last week it hit like 65 and 70. It was kind of nice. It's like, oh, okay. All right, we've transitioned into spring. Daylight savings uh, happened on the clocks. Okay, good signs. And then just two days ago or three days ago, it dropped down to 25 degrees and it was snowing. What? Thanks, Ohio. SMH. SM to the H.
Cynics made a hilarious April Fool's video. Where he did paint over pals. And he did one of Almond Tandoori. And it was uh, something I sent him. Because he was asking, like, hey, is there anything that you have on hand that I could use? Like, yeah, sure. Take this. It's a work in progress. I think, oh, that's perfect. <laughs> um, and his paint over was hilarious. I actually uh, started um, changing my piece to, to take those uh, crits. You pretty much change the whole thing. And just for fun, I'm actually doing it. <clears throat> oh man, so I'm looking at my sketchbook at an angle because, you know, having it on the table so that the camera can see it. Um, it looks different to me from my angle than what I'm seeing on the screen. Uh, that's funny. So I got to remember that things are going to be are going to be slightly skewed. It'd be nice if we could just have some kind of hovering, floating, like, window, and it's showing what's being recorded, and you, you can angle it at any angle, and um, any focal length, any zoom, and you can make it transparent so you don't have to worry about you know, a camera floating here because I can't knock it with my head if I, you know, want to actually see my drawing. Or another idea would be like super high def definition glasses um, recording what I'm seeing from my point of view. That, that'd be awesome. In fact, I'm going to look into that. Maybe there is a thing like that already. <laughs> when I was at the coffee shop today, um, there was a lady there with her corgi waiting for her drink outside. And I was sitting outside, um, just writing my plan for the day. <laughs> and a car pulls up and all you hear is, oh my God, is that a corgi? We're gonna pet you soon. And like, I thought maybe she knew the person with the dog. And then these two other women come out and like, hi, okay, can we, uh, <laughs> hi, can we, pet, can, we, can we pet your dog? And then she's like, yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, he's so cute. What's his name? What's his name? Oh, my God. Hello. Hello. And then uh, one of them, like, gets sits on the floor or the ground. And this dog was just having a blast. It was like, yes, this is what life is about. And uh, it started, like, jumping and, you know, licking their faces and, like, you know, squirming and, it was, a, it was a funny little moment. The dog's name was Tubby. I laughed. It was good. I like it. I like it. I'd like to abandon it to do something else, though. Here's the dilemma in a sketchbook. It's like, we got this drawing. I like it. Um, and then there's this other real estate. It's like, well, I could just start something new, something random. But then the question is, do I allow it to impede on this design? Or should I design something as a part of it as an illustration? And ugh. But it is just a sketchbook, so...
If I wanted to, I could do all that, but I'm good. Yeah, I know I'm also, I think I'm a bit behind. I wanted to post this video on Saturday just to have a consistency, but I got really caught up with some stuff. Unfortunately, stuff like um, recording the course, but also playing Bloodborne. Yo, dear Lord, what a game. I'm, you know, I think I was meant to wait until now to play it because when I first bought it like six years ago, when I was still working at ArenaNet as a concept artist, um, <laughs> nice flex, buddy. Um, I got the game because it looked cool, uh, but not having ever played a Souls game or anything that's that difficult or, you know, seemingly difficult at least. Uh, I hated it. I was like, this is the dumbest thing. Why would I waste my time trying to learn like all these moves and fight the bosses and read all this stuff? I'm not going to read. Just give me something simple like Overwatch. And so, yeah, I spent a lot of time just playing simple games, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, But then after some time and then witnessing my buddy Steven Zapata describe his love for this game kind of um was a nice little kindling of a fire within to say hey maybe there is something here and <laughs> that really is aside from it being difficult which is fine you can you can always get good and figure out patterns and develop dexterity and all that but uh the world building dear lord it is something. It, it's such a masterpiece of world building. And, and it's amazing to see that because it's like this, the creators behind this somehow have had their personal, I guess, permission in themselves to just do that. And, and that to me it was uh, a nice creative insight <laughs> insight um to i guess up you know if you're to pursue a passion project it is possible and you know the lore the backstories the vibes the secrets the the alternate endings the different uh bosses and and all the enemies it's not just uh, copy and paste. Like each one has its own uh, novel design to it, for the most part, and it's intended that way. And so, yeah, I'm still very much a noob, but it is. It has been very eye-opening. <laughs> um. I'm not, I'm not even that far into the game. I'm at the uh, Blood Starved Beast. And I know I... Sorry to derail, but... I know I could just use the uh, cheese method using the pungent blood cocktails, which I'll probably just do that. But I'm like, I want to do it without that. I want to get good and... You know. You know. I've seen people fight the, the beast without using the cheese method. And I was fighting Jura... Um, the the Gatling gun dude in the old Yarnum, spoiler warning. And uh, I kept trying to fight him also without cheesing, cheesing meaning like, you know, pushing him off or shooting him so he staggers and just falls off and dies. I wanted to fight him for real, and so there I was like dodging and and like getting him down to to low health, and he uses a blood vial so his health is all the way up again. And I'm like, oh, I got him, I got him. And so <laughs> I go off to the corner because it's you're on top of a really small roof. And he gets behind one of the pillars and like tries to attack. 
and just falls off and dies. And I'm like, what? Wait, I'm not done with you. Come back. What? And once he's dead, you you can't fight him again. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe my next run, I'll try to try to do it. There's something about this hunched over, bent over kind of vibes going on in, in my drawings today. Too much Bloodborne. Welcome, Hunter. Yeah. <sighs> Got to say, uh, you know, I've I've studied the skull before, and I think that's certainly what had has given me an edge over not knowing the skull for drawing faces and painting heads, but studying it again a little bit more in depth um, really makes a difference. It's like really knowing what's under there, as opposed to trying to guess where stuff goes on the surface, um, has a huge impact on your, your art. It's definitely one of the foundations that are unfortunately overlooked. And uh, my fear about the course that I want to do and the things I want to teach is, and I understand, but most people I feel want to just skip and jump to being able to do the magical looking stuff, you know, the, the perfect golden egg ideal. But, you know, there's so much that's required to put in ahead of time as a foundation for the brick wall that you want to make. Otherwise, it'll just fall apart. You know, like uh, understanding the skull. And, and, you know, there are obvious examples of very, very good artists out there who kind of skip to it and just make, you know, pretty portraits, nice lighting, nice uh, glow effects and all that. You know, coming from like a, a 2D background or something, you know, drawing anime, etc., comics, which is fine. Um, but even if you're coming from that, studying the foundations will only make that stuff better. I, could, I guess I could sort of equate that to music. So, you know, I play guitar and I have since, I guess, 2006. Um, and I've never learned how to read music. You know, I'm pretty, pretty decent at guitar. But if you ask me to read music or tell you what time signatures are and, and all that, I'm just... I don't know. 
And I'm sure if I did read music and studied classical music and tried to do Paganini on guitar, um, that I'd get much better. But since I do just treat it as a hobby, I'm not too interested. And uh, I'm very, very satisfied with um, just doing it as a therapeutic experience and pick up the guitar, sing a song or two and get back to drawing. But if I wanted to pursue music as something more, wanting to master it or or be proficient at some, some higher level things, I know that I would have to read music or learn to read it, or at least understand time signatures and, and um, understanding different keys and octaves and all that. And if you do come from a music background, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and you might even think, hey, that's just easy stuff. It'll take not too long to learn it. Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, and I'm sure there are some things that are so complex that it takes decades of, of understanding music theory. But if you, I guess what I'm saying is if you want to treat art like a hobby and not something that you want to master into a sense of proficiency, then yeah, maybe you don't have to learn the, the, the foundations uh, entirely and that's fine. But if you do, then you got to know the skull. You got to understand how light works. You got to know perspective. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, depending on what it is that you want to learn, not everything needs perspective. Not everything needs lighting. If you want to do just flat artwork and 2D shapes, that's perfectly fine, too. I'm going to finish up this sketch and then call it a wrap. Call it a day. Wrap it up. All right, that's, uh, that's enough for now. All right, thanks for joining me on this. Um, please enjoy your day. Please enjoy your artwork. And also, please be nice to each other. We're all just people here on this planet. I will see you next time. Bye.